The scientific method is a logical step-by-step -step procedure for solving a problem. There are a number of specific steps that need to be followed in order to execute the scientific method properly. Step one involves defining the problem. In this case, you would ask a very specific question that would guide your experimentation so that you can find an answer to your question. As an example, we will use the work of Francesco Redi. He's an Italian scientist who lived in the 1600s. In the time of Francesco Redi, people thought that living things could come from non-living things. For example, maggots, which are small worm-like bugs, could come from decaying meat. This idea is known as spontaneous generation. Reddy knew that that was not true. It just couldn't be. So he decided to test this idea with an experiment. So he started the scientific method by defining his problem. The question that he asked was, do maggots come from decaying meat? And obviously today we know that they don't. But in this time frame, they had to do an experiment to figure it out. Step two of the scientific method involves gathering information or doing research. You might go on the internet and do some research on a reputable web page in order to find information to answer your question. But in Francesco Reddy's time, he couldn't really go on the internet. So he might have to do some reading or perhaps go out into the field and do his own research. He doubted that something alive could come from something dead. He looked around in his environment and noticed, well, horses come from other horses, cows come from other cows, birds come from other birds, and people come from other people. So how could maggots possibly come from something dead, like decaying meat? So based on this information that he gathered from his surroundings and his direct observation, he decided that spontaneous generation could definitely not be the answer to this question. So he was going to design an experiment in order to answer that question, where do they come from? Step three of the scientific method is forming a hypothesis. A hypothesis is a possible solution to your question. In Reddy's case, his question was, do maggots come from decaying meat? Well, he had noticed, based on his research, that living things come from other living things of the same kind. So he would hypothesize that maggots come from eggs laid by flies, not from decaying meat. But rather than just phrase the question like this, we'll put it in an if-then format. So, as far as Reddy is concerned, if maggots come from flies and not decaying meat, then meat that is covered should produce no maggots. This gives him a good outline for designing an experiment to answer his question. Step four is when you actually test your hypothesis by conducting an experiment. In Reddy's case, he set up two jars. Both had pieces of decaying meat inside. The only difference between the jars is that one had a cover and the other did not. The one with no cover would attract flies to the meat. So each of these two groups are referred to as an experimental group and a control group. In this case, the experimental group is the jar that has no lid and allows flies to get to the meat. An experimental group only has one variable that is different from your control group. 
in this case the flies which can get to the meat. The control group, which is the jar that has the lid, is used as a comparison. It does not allow the flies to get to the meat. This way, Francesco Reddy would be able to discern whether or not the maggots in the meat were coming from the flies or from the meat. Haha! -ha! This will prove that I'm right. Step five of the scientific method involves making and recording observations. There are two major types of data, qualitative data and quantitative data. Qualitative data involve using one or more of your senses to describe the quality of the group. So you might use your sight, your hearing, your sense of taste, touch, or smell. For quantitative data, you are using a tool to measure or quantify something. So you would be using some sort of in instrument in order to measure your data in this case. This type of data is numbers. In the case of Reddy's experiment with the two jars, some of the qualitative data, after finding the results, could be the color of the meat, the smell of the meat, or the texture of the meat. These are all descriptions that would use words to describe the data that results from the experiment. For quantitative data, he could use a thermometer to measure the temperature inside the jar. He could use a balance to measure the mass of the meat. He could count the number of flies, or he could count the number of maggots. All of this information would be recorded as a number and is considered quantitative data. In this case, the data that Reddy was interested in was whether or not there were maggots in the meat at the end of the experiment. And what he happened to see in this case was that there were maggots only in the experimental group, not in the control group that had the cover on the jar. Aha! I knew spontaneous generation was not correct. Step six of the scientific method involves analyzing the data to find information that either supports or goes against your hypothesis. In Reddy's experiment with the jars and the meat, he was looking to see if maggots come from decaying meat or if they come from flies. The relevant data here is the number of maggots at the end of the experiment. That's an example of quantitative data. Quantitative data is oftentimes represented in a table. Maybe Reddy's table might have looked like this. He might have had five jars that were open and five jars that had a cover to keep the flies out. He would count the number of maggots in the open jar and count the number of maggots in the covered jar and record his data. This is some sample data that Reddy might have found during his experiment. As you can see, there are a number of maggots in each of the experimental groups and zero maggots in the control group, which was the jar with the cover. Reddy might have conducted averages for each group. The average number of maggots in the open jar in this case was 22, whereas the average number of maggots in the covered jar was zero. In step seven of the scientific method, you draw your conclusions. This is when you decide whether your data supports or disproves your hypothesis. In the case of Reddy's experiment, 
his data supported the idea that maggots do not come from decaying meat, but rather from some other element in the environment, for example, the flies. Based on this information, we can come to the conclusion that maggots do not come from decaying meat. Therefore, the idea of spontaneous generation was false. The final step of the scientific method involves communicating your findings to the scientific community. This would involve writing a formal lab report and having it published in a scientific journal. In this video, we're going to go over an example design process. The steps that we're going to cover include observing the world around you, brainstorming solutions, comparing ideas, making prototypes to test ideas, and repeating steps all to solve a problem. In observation, you just pay close attention to the world around you and you look for any problems that you might be able to solve by designing something. You can pay close attention to things at school, or while walking around outside, or maybe even in your own home. Let's walk through an example so that you can learn a little bit more about how designing works. So I've spent some time looking around at home, at school, and even while playing sports, thinking about different problems that I can solve. And I've encountered many problems, but let me tell you about the one that I want to try to tackle right now. So my favorite sport is volleyball. And when you're by yourself, it's pretty difficult to practice your skills alone. So I wish that there was something that could help you practice when you don't have anybody else around. Now that we have a problem to solve, let's start brainstorming different solutions to that problem. Brainstorming is an incredibly important step in the engineering design process. If you can think of multiple ways to solve a problem, then you have a good chance of finding a really good solution. So let's get to it. I've brainstormed many solutions to this problem, including services that help you find other people to practice with and find a coach to help you practice but I've also explored devices that will launch a volleyball you can then practice with. Three interesting ideas I came up with include a kicking device to launch a ball, a slingshot device, and a pitching machine volleyball launcher. Now that I've picked an idea that I want to explore further, the next thing an engineer will typically do is make quick prototypes to figure out more details about their solution. Quick prototypes are useful because they don't invest a lot of time or money, and they keep things flexible so that you can explore other solutions as well. What I have here is a prototype made of cardboard that's going to help me explore the kickball volleyball launcher solution. So it's basically just a cardboard structure with a hammer that's going to act as the kicking force for launching the ball up into the air. So after you've made your models, the next important step is to test them out. That way, you can figure out a little bit more about where your project should go. Some important questions that you hope your model will answer are things like, does my idea even work? Do I need to talk to users some more? Is it worthwhile to make a more refined, more expensive, and more time-consuming prototype? Those are the kind of things that you hope a good model will answer. So to test this one out, I've gotten into a room that's got a little bit higher ceilings so we can see what this thing can do. Yeah. So even though that was a lot of fun, we actually learned a lot from this prototype. Even though it wasn't that expensive or durable. One thing that I noticed is that it's kind of difficult to get the hammer to impart some momentum on the ball and launch it up into the air. Another thing that I noticed is that 
the ramp kind of has to be designed pretty well. Otherwise, if the ball hits it, it's not going to get launched up into the air. Finally, another thing I noticed about this idea is that by design, it's not really that portable because it's dependent on lugging around a big heavy weight. So that could be a problem if you want to take this thing out to a volleyball net. <clears throat> Based on the things that I've learned, I've actually decided to switch from a kickball launching method to a slingshot method. Remember how I mentioned that you don't always get it right the first time through. Because this video is a little bit short, I don't have time to go through another model at this level. So we're going to skip ahead to a more refined prototype. Okay, so here's our more refined prototype. It's made of wood, so it's a bit more durable than the last one. And it's going to help us find out a little bit more about the slingshot solution. So the way that this prototype works is that these elastic bands up here will act as the slingshot with these two posts. And this hook is going to connect to a pin that goes through these holes right down here. Then, when the pin gets removed, the ball should get launched from this funnel. So let's see how well it works. So even though this prototype worked, am I done? Absolutely not. There's still a lot more to do. I could do stuff like improve the model by talking to users and see if it actually meets their needs. I can make it a little bit more user friendly and easier to use. I could add some more features, something like a ball feeder so that you can have multiple balls and then it launches them one at a time. There's still plenty of things to do. Keep in mind that the design process is actually an iterative thing. So you'd go through it over and over again until you arrive at something that's ready to go to market. I hope you learned a bit about the design process and your hope to go out there and design something yourself. Okay, so let's recap the process we took. We made an observation that it's difficult to practice volleyball by yourself. We brainstormed solutions to that problem and we compared ideas to pick our favorite one. We made prototypes to test those solutions and then we had to repeat some of those steps in order to find even better solutions. That's how we came up with a way to solve the problem of it being difficult to practice volleyball on your own. The main differences between engineering design process and the scientific method is the purpose and the goal. Um, for engineering, the purpose is to create a solution to a specific problem. In science, the purpose is generally just to discover things, um, generally about the natural world. So it could be physics and how things move and how gravity affects things. It could be biology um, from, you know, why do the animals hibernate and what happens with their metabolic rates during hibernation. It's just sort of to discover things. The goal of engineering is to create a cost-effective workable solution. So again, you're going back to that um, creating a an actual answer, a solution to a problem that currently exists. Not only that, cost is a big um, is a big uh, thing to dis to consider during engineering because you could create the best solution to a problem, but if it's so expensive that no one can afford it, then it's not going to do anyone much good. So part of the engineering is wrapped up in the cost of actually implementing. Um, your solution. Whereas in science, our goal is really just to add to the collective knowledge and our understanding of the world and how things work and um, what can we do with it on, a, on an idealistic level. Um, engineering and science go hand in hand because without discovering things about our natural world, without knowing how things work, um, it makes it much more difficult to create an actual solution. To a problem. So these two things go hand in hand, even though they are a little bit different.